Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to all of you, whoever is uh, attending today and wherever you are. So today we are happy to welcome back Dr. Fausto Rodriguez from Johns Hopkins, and he will be continuing his uh, neuropath lecture series. And in fact, this is the 10th one, and this would be the penultimate of his uh, 11th lecture neuropath series, and uh, it would be the last one for the year. So without much ado, like uh, I would uh, hand over the microphone to Dr. Rodriguez. And as always, so please feel free to post your comments or questions on both Facebook and YouTube. Thank you so much, Dr. Rodriguez. Over to you. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you all again uh, when, and to discuss uh, one of the, uh, my favorite topics within surgical neuropathology, which are the tumors of uh, the peripheral nervous system. So. The tumors of the peripheral nervous system encompass various areas in, in surgical pathology, actually. So some tumors you, you may see them more in, in dermatopathology or soft tissue pathology and also neuropathology. So it's, a, it's an area that intersects a lot of different uh, areas. So here I give you the summary of what it has been listed in, in the CNS tumors of 2016, which usually doesn't cover all the peripheral nerve tumors, but cover the ones that you tend to see more in a certain neurosurgical practice, namely the tumors that tend to, you may see in, in intracranially or in the sp in spinal uh, nerve roots, not everything that you see in the soft tissue. So this is a kind of like a, not an all encompassing, but a group of a, a nice scheme of, of, of things that you may see uh, in that, in that context. One of them for, of course, melanotic schwannoma is listed as such in the 2016 CNS um, WHO, but now we know that's probably more a distinct entity on their own. And it's now being denoted by several different terms, but it's proposed terms, but one of them is melanotic Schwannian tumor. Let's move then into the cases. Uh, there are several cases to, we have 12 cases to go through. And uh, we can start with case number one. Hopefully some of you had a chance to preview them. This is a 38 year old man that developed chronic left ankle pain after uh, injury of the Achilles tendon and therefore had a left sh uh, sural nerve biopsy. And this is the scan slide. And it's an excellent representation of this pathology. This is what you have. You have a variety of components. You have connective tissue. It's important to distinguish that from peripheral nerve, which are all these little fascicle here. And you see it's a dramatic expression of these little fascicles intermixed with fibrous tissue. Here you have a more intact peripheral nerve fascicle. So you see these are really tiny, disorganized and associated with connective tissue. This is what is known as microfasciculation. So you have very tiny little fascicles growing in a disorganized fashion, if you do certain stains, you will have all the components of the peripheral nerve sheath here. You will have Schwann cells proliferating alongside with uh, perineurium. And also each one of these little fascicles will probably have one or, uh, or more uh, axons coursing through it. So uh, the clue here is that you have a history of injury also. That's a very important clue. And that it remained painful. So the diagnosis here is traumatic neuroma. It is a reactive process. It's not a neoplasm, but it sometimes forms masses. It's painful. And of course, a history of trauma is sometimes given, a history of surgery is one of those lesions that, uh, yes, it's reactive and uh, you may say, well, it may not be as critical to recognize it, but uh, this is a type of lesion that 
oftentimes has uh, not so much relevance for neoplastic treatment, but for one for pain, ma for pain management. These are very painful lesions many times. And uh, litigation, because it's a really an objective um, representation of trauma. So if there's a history of questionable history of trauma, the person has chronic pain, this is something that tells you, yes, that there's at least a reason for a person to have, uh, that had been injured first and to have pain. So it's an important reactive non-neoplastic lesion to recognize in peripheral nerve. Let's move next to case number two. This is a 34 year old man that had a history of NF1 and had excision of multiple uh, predominantly cutaneous tumors. This is the low power view. You can argue that it has some overlap with the previous lesion, at least at the morphology level, but here the fascicles have more of an expansion. Okay, they're expanded by a Schwann cell proliferation. And if you see this in high power, this is not a difficult diagnosis, right? It's a neurofibroma of some kind. You have this shredded collagen type of pattern, mixoid change, and a mixture of predominantly uh, Schwann cells, uh, maybe some um, fibroblasts and other components. Here you start having some degenerative type of atypia. More of these. So at high power, the diagnosis of neurofibroma is not difficult. You see this in many contexts in surgical pathology. Uh, and now the next step will be to classify it. And if you see here, you can get an impression that you're having different fascicles involved. And this defines the plexiform neurofibroma variant, which is uh, almost always restricted to neurofibromatosis type one. It's almost pathognomonic of the disorder, uh, with the exception that there are a few ones that can be superficial or small and may not be associated with the disorder. It can be probably is thought to be related to a more localized um, clonal uh, expansion of, uh, of cells that have lost NF1. But if you go high power, again, the histology is very similar to neurofibromas of different types. Now, something that was uh, interesting and hopefully you ca caught it was this here. You have this nodule here. And this is a, a first glance, it can be problematic because plexiform neurofibroma is the subtype that has the of neurofibromas that has the highest propensity for malignant transformation. And many of these neurofibromatosis type one patients that have large plexiform neurofibromas, they get follow up with over time for this reason. And if you have a, a development of pain or increased growth, changes, abnormal changes in imaging, this may uh, suggest the possibility of malignant transformation, which usually takes the, the appearance of an area that is more atypical and more cellular. So when we see things like that, in that context, we start getting worried. But if you look at these uh, and think about it, it's very circumscribed. I think there, was a, there may even have been some mites, but the cells are a little larger, bundled. Uh, these had uniform S100 expression. And actually, it looks almost more like a baby schwannoma, really. Uh, so very well circumscribed in an otherwise typical neurofibroma. And actually, this is a Schwannian cell nodule. which sometimes happens. It's something that is important to recognize is, is you do see it in the context of a plexiform neurofibroma. It's important to recognize at first that it is that the main tumor, the dominant tumor is really a plexiform neurofibroma. It's a pathology that's important to, uh, to recognize since it's almost pathognomonic of this NF1 syndrome and that you don't separate, you don't interpret it as being malignant. So 
these type of nodules can have and, and they can and sometimes be focal like in this case or they can be extensive and, and dominate a part of the tumor. Sometimes these tumors are uh, called hybrid nerve sheath tumors and we are seeing more hybrid nerve sheath tumors so that's something to, uh, to have in mind. Uh, but if the dominant pathology is uh, plexiform nerve fibroma, that's the one that you have to be alert uh, about for uh, patient management. Next, we can move to uh, case number three. 55 year old uh, man with a left leg mass. All right, and we have here another neoplasm. Composed predominantly of small spindle cells, some of them a little wavy, not as much collagen as the previous case. And something that I did notice you have here even some pigmentation. Curious finding here. Some vessels. Smaller vessels here. Some cautery, probably. A bit here, more of these uh, shredded type collagen, not the best example, but. Start suggesting at least some sort of uh, relation to a neurofibroma. Keep moving around. You do here have again a little bit more something that reminds you of neurofibroma. Now, uh, this was a very large mass actually that was extending deeper into, I don't have all the sections here, but deeper into the soft tissues. And then you have areas like this, that when you see them, they start worrying you a little bit, if you are not a, a acquainted with this entity. And you see the cells, there's an increase in cellularity, and the cells are almost acquiring a round cell uh, type of appearance. More areas of increased cellularity. Something to highlight is that mitotic activity here is not that uh, high, although you can have a few sometimes in these cases. But a very cellular area, again, it worries you when you see it, in particular at low power, you start seeing something that looks very hypocellular. You say here, this is probably a neurofibroma or some sort of nerve sheath tumor, and then something that is extremely cellular in the middle of it. Uh, and so first glance, it worries you here even. She so starts seeing looking, appearing a little bit blue and rounder rather than wavy. Sometimes you can have deep infiltration of soft tissues, even a skeletal muscle in these cases. And I do have some stains for you. This is S100, and it tells you again, confirms that this is a tumor of uh, Schwannian phenotype, the well differentiated areas are S100 positive with a cytoplasmic and a nuclear fashion. But these denser areas that look a bit almost like round cell areas are actually strongly S100 positive as well. So they retain this uh, Schwann cell phenotype. 
if you have lost of it, uh, you will be a bit more worried about malignant transformation. But here you see a lot of round sales, very strong as 100. And here we had a little bit of depletion, but this is the CAI 67. And this is very reassuring. Even those areas that are a bit cellular have a very low proliferative rate. That reassures you that probably you're not dealing necessarily with something malignant. And it's something important to recognize in this case. So, This is another neurofibroma subtype, and it's called massive soft tissue neurofibroma. This is really only, only develops as exclusive of patients with NF1. This doesn't occur outside of that um, setting. As I mentioned, the plexiform neurofibroma is almost always limited, particularly the large ones are almost always limited to NF1, but you can have smaller, small plexiform neurofibromas that occur in the absence of the syndrome. But this large, uh, massive soft tissue neurofibromas only occur in the presence of neurofibroma. Oftentimes, they can overlie a plexiform neurofibroma as well. And they have, this is something uh, that is typical. These are, they have a diffuse pattern of growth. They can infiltrate deeply into soft tissue, skeletal muscle. Uh, but those areas have almost no uh, malignant uh, potential. The exception or the caveat here is that they can be overlying a plexiform neurofibroma component, and that is usually what the component that may have some sort of malignant transformation potential. So these are the types of the neurofibromas that are the, that can also be associated with uh, alterations in in growth of the of the limbs uh, or or face when you see them. So. Um, is is there can be really massive and again essentially it's only limited to patients with NF1 syndrome. The these uh, very cellular areas is something also important to recognize that they are typical of it and they are not uh, necessarily indicate the the presence of a malignant component. It's just part of the tumor type and recognizing that they are strongly S100 positive and also have low CAS system and index in this context in this syndrome. Uh, tells you that uh, this is you still uh, uh, compatible with a benign diagnosis. Let's move to the next case. Moving into a 22-year-old woman that had worsening headache, balance, and hearing problems, and underwent a MRI of the head. And here you see this large mass that is located in a cold war, which is all when you hear about it, it really almost always suggests the diagnosis. And it's the cerebellum pontine angle. Here's the pons, and this is the cerebellum. So in that con that area, you have a mass that is, this is a, with contrast, a T1 with contrast, and you can see it has some cystic change, very spherical. And something also, another clue, it's really here has this elongated extension. In this region, you do have a lot of cranial nerves exiting. And this one is tracking along that cranial nerve, suggesting that it is related to it. Here you can see the T2 also showing that it's very well demarcated, a little bit of edema, but not much. Uh, and this is really a clue of this diagnosis. Just knowing where you are and, and these imaging findings is uh, actually very helpful in the diagnosis. This one came fragmented, and it's not uncommon to have this uh, situation with samples 
from that are intracranial, some cautery. You can see that probably there was a it was a little bit vascular. You go on high power. You see a few bundles of cells. Maybe you recognize them as Schwannian, and this is uh, this a little bit larger than what you see with a neurofibroma. The cells, a few vacuolated cells. Some of them probably part of this Schwannian neoplasm. Others may be true macrophages. Again, you have almost the appearance of a biphasic neoplasm. Again, a bit of a nuclear enlargement, not much for mitotic activity. Some larger vessels associated with hemorrhage. Collagen. Almost no proliferation. Here you have some of these vessels and something that is characteristic. Uh, frequently they are hellenized or have throm thrombosis. Maybe some chronic inflammation. So this one is almost given by the preoperative appearance. You do have a bit of nuclear enlargement here, and that is okay. This is the degenerative type of atypia. You do see this commonly in tumors of the central nervous systems and also tumors of the peripheral nervous system. And it is not to be worrisome for malignancy. It's just something that, that you can see is degenerative. You see this chromatin that is a bit smudgy. In uh, this tumor type, they are uh, sometimes referred as ancient change. Here you have also some kind of cystic change, but not a cystic lining. That's also very characteristic. Goes well with that imaging finding of some cysts. And the diagnosis here is schwannoma. It's just a conventional schwannoma. Very common. It's probably the most common neoplasm. It is the most common neoplasm that you see in the cerebellopontin angle. This one had a biphasic appearance, had areas of Anthony A, areas of Anthony B, and but no barricade bodies, and you don't always have them in at this location, so you don't need them. Uh, these are uniformly S100 positive, as you know, or SOX10 positive. Those are some of the markers that you can use. Uh, the idea here is to know that sometimes they come uh, fragmented. Sometimes they get, uh, they are obscured also by treatment-related changes because. Schwannomas at this location, many times they're slow growing, they're small, they may be treated with observation, uh, or, or that meaning no treatment at all, or with a localized radiation. Uh, and the ones that go to surgery, the ones that are getting larger are not responding to more conventional type of treatment. So, um, so you may have some changes, some associated with that, that may be difficult to distinguish, to, to interpret, but this is really something that uh, occurs at this location it's, and, and it's, it's important to recognize. Moving to the next case, this will be a 13-year-old male with uh, cutaneous masses, multiple cutaneous masses. And we'll go a little bit, there was a bit more history to this, uh, but we'll go over it in a minute. Okay, and you see this lesion is superficial. You can see here skin. And of course, a neoplasm underneath in the form of multiple nodules. Again, a Schwannian type of appearance, moderately sized nuclei, nodules there. Nodules, there's some entrapment of collagen. Suggestion almost here of some palisading.
hyperchromatic nuclei, a bit of bundle or fascicle formation. Here you have better outline Veroke bodies, right? This palisading around these central areas, characteristic. Almost when you hear about it, you know, it's almost diagnostic. Uh, what is really, of course, unusual here is that you have multiple nodules, not well-formed capsule, uh, and a bit more of a diffuse pattern of growth in some areas, almost. So this patient, and this is why this case is relevant, uh, was actually uh, a while back was diagnosed with neurofibromatosis type 1, and that was because of these tumors. So they, they actually, these tumors were called plexiform neurofibromas actually in the past, uh, and it's not. Uh, these are actually plexiform schwannomas. That exists. It's something important to have in mind. Is uh, almost, what's the distinction? Essentially, every single nodule that you see here, you have a plexiform pattern of growth, but every nodule is a schwannoma almost. It's almost like a distinct schwannoma. You don't need, you don't have the capsule, but you see here almost every area, you might have a little bit of, again, uh, internodular uh, Schwann cell proliferation, but it's really almost every nodule here looks like a conventional schwannoma if you go on high power. It's superficial. Um, that's something to have in mind. Many of these are related to skin or mucosa. And uh, the cytology, again, is that of a schwannoma. So this patient actually on re-review and re-evaluation uh, was found to have other, uh, alter, other uh, manifestations and it was diagnosed actually as NF2. So uh, this is an important distinction to make. Uh, the plexiform schwannomas first, then patients with, they can occur in patients with NF2, but more commonly they are sporadic. So in contrast to plexiform neurofibromas that are almost pathognomonic of NF1, plexiform schwannomas can occur sporadically. Most of them don't occur with any syndrome. Now, when you start seeing them and they are numerous, that can be associated with a Schwann a schwannoma syndrome, particularly NF2 or schwannomatosis. Those are the two contexts where you can see them. So if there are multiple, uh, you have to have that in mind and you have to at least trigger the, the uh, detailed clinical evaluation for other manifestations. And this patient satisfied criteria for NF2 upon re-evaluation. Re so this is where the patient had multiple plexiform schwannomas. So we have gone through several of the schwannoma subtypes. And um, so you do have some variety. Most of the schwannomas are conventional, but you can have cellular schwannomas, plexiform schwannomas. It's important to uh, understand this heterogeneity because it's a tumor that, as we know, is uh, a Schwann cell neoplasm that is benign uh, and respective uh, almost never has uh, a it, uh, changes that are malignant. So it, it's it, the different type of, of tumor types that that are part of this spectrum are important to recognize. So another one is, and it's not one of your cases, uh, that in the past was considered to be, this is another schwannoma really, uh, or Schwannian tumor, but one tumor type that was in the past uh, considered to be part of, of the spectrum uh, of schwannomas is melanotic schwannoma. This is not one of your cases again, but I want to show you quickly an example. They can have variable pigmentation, but usually it's very strong. Uh, and it's another tumor that is important to recognize as um, because it oftentimes has a lot of morphologic overlap with melanotic tumors. Clues about the diagnosis are uh, association with nerves, but they can be also okay, occur in viscera. Uh, but it's another tumor now. Again, it, this historically has been called melanotic schwannoma, but uh, recent evidence have documented that many of these tumors are actually aggressive. They are not as aggressive as melanoma. You have to make sure that you distinguish them from melanomas, but they uh, many times can be locally aggressive and have metastatic potential. That is in contrast to conventional schwannoma that has 
almost no essential, essentially no metastatic potential. So another subtype that goes in this category, but in print now felt to be a distinct category and is going to be in, in future classifications is going to be separated from a conventional schwannoma. All right, let's move now to case number six. This was a 73 year old man with a lower eyelid, eyelid, uh, eyelid lesion that was resected or excised. So this is the lesion here. And you can argue it has uh, the slight appearance almost of a plexiform type of appearance. Relatively circumscribed, you have some skeletal muscle fibers that are being pushed rather than infiltrated. And you can argue it does have, almost reminds you a little bit of one of those plexiform sh uh, schwannomas. Except that you start seeing things here that look more like mini fascicles. So when you look at this uh, lesion, you start seeing it looks like a schwannoma, but it looks slightly funny. Smaller little bundles. Areas that remind you a little bit more of a neuroma also. So uh, this is what, those are some of the, the clues of what you're dealing with. And here, actually, stains can be helpful. First, here you have S100, very strong, uniformly strong. So well-differentiated Schwann cell neoplasms, without exception really, have strong S100 that is nuclear and cytoplasmic. If you are considering a Schwannoma or some sort of Schwannian tumor and it is negative for S100, you are uh, most likely you either have technical problems with your uh, immunostaining or you're wrong, really. So it's something that must give you pause when you have something that is negative. Here, very strong, uniform S100 positivity in these cells. And this is neurofilament protein, which we use it a lot to document, to outline axons. And actually here you have numerous axons coursing through the tumor here. Usually, schwannoma, which is the main differential diagnosis here, ha can have a few entrapped axons, but it tends to be more of a solid tumor, a solid that tumor that displaces axons when it's growing. This one looks like a schwannoma a little bit, but you are seeing that it really has a high axonal density. And those areas in the periphery, they, they look like little fascicles are indeed almost look like little mini fascicles. So that is what is unique about this here. You have a superficial, eyelid, eyelid, this in this case, eyelid lesion, Schwann cell appearance, not much for a capsule, and a high density almost of, of um, of axons that you uh, that you tend to see more often with uh, some sort of with neuromas, for example.
And the diagnosis here is a solitary circumscribed neuroma, which is the, one of the current names. In the past, that has been called PEN or polysterian encapsulated neuroma. Uh, felt to be in part a misnomer because it's not really palisaded uh, necessarily, and you don't always have a capsule. So, uh, so that is um, a lesion is more part of the derm path literature, but you can see it also in ophthalmic pathology, another area that that I um, also is part of my practice. And um, it's the when when I see this, usually the first thing I think is, well, it looks like a schwannoma, but it's funny. It looks a bit like a plexiform schwannoma, but it's funny. And when you do your stains, when you do particular neurofilament protein, you see that it's really the the extent of axonal density is really not compatible with a conventional schwannoma. That's how that's to me what makes me uh, go in, uh, into this uh, into the uh, arrive at this diagnosis. Moving to case number seven, this is a 29-year-old woman uh, with a left tibial nerve lesion. And actually, this was a complex lesion in this case. So I'm showing you the more uh, telling part. But there were multi, uh, there were additional parts that we saw. Uh, this was a bit of a challenge uh, in frozen section. Okay, but this is the relevant one, the one that is uh, available to you. And you can see a bland proliferation. Some cells that are wavy to oval some collagen a few delicate fibers and in areas like these it starts making you think of you know neurofibroma of course is your first interpretation or your or the first uh, diagnosis that comes to mind You have here some axons, evident actually by H and E. You can see these. You can see these. Important to recognize axons on H and E when they appear. Uh, this uh, can be mistaken for other structures. Occasionally, the CNS we have had cases of getting mis mistaken for fungal hyphae, for example. So it's important to get like, acquainted with them. A few collagen fibers, not quite the shredded collagen that you see with um, with your conventional neurofibromas, but certainly some of it makes you think of neurofibroma more than anything else. But a little bit of an heterogeneous appearance. Again, a few some other axons. So in this case, uh, immunostains were also uh, performed. Found to be helpful. First of all, again, S100. So there were a lot of areas that were S100 positive. So you can, it was helpful in confirming that the tumor has a phenotype, uh, at least is in part Schwannian. But compared with other tumors that we were seeing, you see there is S100 also highlighting uh, part of the axons. Uh, but you do have really a feel that there are other cells that are not quite S100 positive. So it's the, the density of S100 is a little bit more modest. So you probably, this was a clue that probably you have another uh, component as well.
and this is EMA, particularly in those denser areas, you do have a component that is EMA positive. And this is a phenomenon that we're seeing uh, more often now or recognizing. So there is a bit more EMA. You can have with neurofibroma is, of course, a Schwann cell neoplasm. The Schwann cells are the neoplastic component in neurofibromas. But you can have rare EMA positive cells. That is something that uh, is really part. Neurofibromas are somewhat heterogeneous. You do have other cell components. But this extent of EMA was a little higher than conventional neurofibroma. And the morphology was not really that classic. So, um, so this was a bit, in a, in a sense, difficult. So actually, this was a hybrid nerve sheath tumor, a neurofibroma perineurioma. That's what we were seeing. There was another uh, lesion, actually. This was a separate nodule, so this was actually uh, very puzzling to the surgeon uh, since uh, they were in there and they saw uh, a nodule that was separate. And, and this is the nodule here. It looks more like a conventional schwannoma, really. And then in the nerve proper, in the nerve fascicle proper, they found that other proliferation that was uh, intraoperatively a little bubbly, a little bit mixoidy. Uh, they were concerned on, uh, I think, on imaging findings where it was a cyst. This one actually probably will qualify more to a, a cellular schwannoma component. So this is a this was a very distinct separate nodule, and from it, it also you had that other lesion that was actually more infiltrative. So they that made this certain think that probably was not really a part of the schwannoma. We saw this in frozen section, and we call you know this looks like a really schwannoma, but there was that other component. Uh, that actually, uh, to us, we were uh, more favoring uh, neurofibroma. So the first lesion that I showed you, uh, we phrased it as a hybrid nerve sheath tumor. They had neurofibroma and a perineurioma component. The perineurioma component was more evident on immunostaining. Uh, this is a type of uh, situation that we're seeing more now in, in the realm of peripheral nerve sheath tumors. Those of you who see a lot of uh, GI type of biopsies, I don't, uh, may see the encounter this phenomenon more, uh, more commonly. A neurofibroma perineurioma or schwannoma perineurioma combinations of virus kinds. And this one also was distinct in that the nerve also had a distinct lesion that it was a schwannoma. Maybe in areas you could even uh, argue it was a more of a cellular schwannoma component. So some material native that we're seeing. This is important to uh, this is a little, can be problematic if you have a patient that they are relying on this diagnosis to classify them as being part of the syndrome. This patient doesn't have one, but occasionally many of these hybrid nerve sheath tumors also can be more overrepresented in syndromes, particularly schwannomatosis in some NF1. So in those cases, sometimes they need these biopsies to, as, a, as a, they need it for as part of the diagnostic criteria. So sometimes they can be uh, problematic. So it's important if you feel that the tumors are fun, it's good to add this, uh, do a thorough classification with stains uh, to make sure uh, that if you don't have a classic appearance that will tell you this is definitely a schwannoma or a neurofibroma, sometimes being descriptive uh, can, can be also do the trick, can be helpful in a sense. You don't want to overcall something that will lead for the patient to go in, in a different diagnostic uh, clinical category. Moving into case number eight, 
this is a 29 year old woman that had an epidural thoracic spinal mass. Okay, well circumscribed tumor here, a low power. You can almost argue there is a few, is there's association with some peripheral nerve fascicles and maybe even a capsule. Some of these areas remind you a bit of schwannomas as we were seeing. Capsule. Colonized vessels, low power. But something that caught our attention in this case is the cells, more than being spindle, like the Schwannen cell tumors that we were seeing, they were a little bit more oval. Some of them had nucleoli. They had more, the borders were a bit more outlined. Here, nucleolus a little bit more evident, cells look a little more rounder and with some more defined borders here. You can see them here, here. Overall, not much for mitotic activity, which is reassuring. We have some stains. Here, this one was, it's 100 positive. EMA, which I'm showing you here, is negative, kind of limited to the periphery, to the perineurium. So again, it's something that is, this is more the typical pattern that you see with a schwannoma compared to the previous case that I showed you. The EMA is usually limited uh, to, the, uh, to the periphery, to the areas in the capsule, and maybe slightly underneath the capsule. And the other marker that we added was H3K27 trimethylation. This is a marker that we're seeing now more using it. The loss is characteristic of MPNSTs. Here it is preserved. So you have H3K27 trimethylation. We'll go over more in, in a subsequent case over these. KI67 low relatively low so you have a slight uh, morphology that you can interpret in part as epithelioidy but low proliferation had uniform s s100 uh, uh, positivity this is i91 also another marker that is preserved we use it for certain differential diagnosis so we felt that overall, this was consistent with an epithelioid schwannoma. Had a lot of features of schwannoma, and but it had an area of cells that became a little bit more epithelioidy. And why is this relevant? This is relevant because when schwannomas go bad, they don't become just more cellular or more proliferative. They have a change of morphology. And one of the morphology changes that are more typical of schwannomas that become malignant are is in the form of an epithelioid MPNST.
In those cases, usually the atypia is more pronounced. The cells are more overtly epithelioid, larger. Uh, but occasionally, you can have this type of epithelioid change and still uh, recognize as being part of a schwannoma. Moving to the next case, 25-year-old man that had a history of multiple schwannomas at various sites, but had this rapidly growing mass in the distal spine and pelvis. And here you start seeing something that is worrisome. You start seeing necrosis. Certainly you can see that in benign nerve systems, but when you see it, you really have to start paying attention. You can have, you have areas here that are kind of bland, spindle cells. But of course, if you looked at the slides, what really catches your attention is these. These cells are large. They have a prominent nucleoli. In fact, larger than the cells in the case that I just showed you in the previous case. Macronucleoli. Here you go, and really this is a malignant morphology. You do also have quite a few uh, mitosis apparent. Better area. This looks like an epithelial malignancy of some sort. Single cell necrosis. Single cell necrosis, some inflammation but a morphology that is very worrisome, very worrisome. Here you have even a better area. Cells, well-formed borders, a lot of ample cytoplasm, macronucleoli. You have even more of these. Here you have, of course, a differential diagnosis of carcinoma, melanoma, et cetera. Here the history was very useful, of course. Immunostains demonstrated strong S100 positivity. This was actually required an extensive resection, uh, including uh, a part of the vertebra. So it was really a destructive, aggressive lesion. More of these. And everywhere you look, you really have significant atypia in a very worrisome morphology. So this is actually an epithelioid MPNST arising in a schwannoma in a patient that had a clinical diagnosis of schwannomatosis. So as I mentioned to you, schwannomas are uh, almost never undergo malignant transformation, but when they do, this is the morphology that you tend to see more commonly. It's in the form of an epithelioid. It's a change in morphology. It's not only an increase in proliferation or in cellularity. You can have cellular schwannomas that are very proliferative and very cellular, but it's really a distinct change. And, and this is what we're seeing here. Uh, it's, this is really epithelioid uh, MPNST. Here, the stains are a bit more tricky because in conventional MPNST, usually you have S100 loss partial at least most of the cases this one retains that you have a lot of s100 positivity uh, expression you have retention of h3k27 trimethylation uh, many of these actually have ini1 loss so it's something to have in mind this one in, in this case we didn't see that but uh, almost more than slightly more than half of epithelioid mpnsts have ini1 loss and there is a subset of schwannomatosis familiar schwannomatosis that have germline mutations in INI1, which further uh, creates some sort of association of, with these uh, 
Schwann cell neoplasms and, and certain genetic syndromes. So it is important, probably plays an important role in the biology of, of, of Schwann and biology. Next is a 35 year old woman that had this uh, mass in the brachial plexus. Okay, this is a very cellular proliferation. Just to move a little quickly on this, this one actually the patient has a history of NF1. You see here a lot of collagen. You have a little bit of increase in um, cellularity. Still interspersed collagen. So that's, that sometimes is reassuring when you see it in neurofibromas. You also are seeing here a bit of this degenerative type of atypia, which you can also see in neurofibromas. Here, this is a better area. This here looks a more conventional neurofibroma really here. This is just, and this, it looks like it's the precursor for this more cellular lesion. And if you move around, you start seeing increased cellularity and something that is very worrisome, really very worrisome. areas like this here. You see here, you start seeing real nuclear elongation in hyperchromasia, atypia, cells being here back to back. That, this is very worrisome when you see it in a neurofibroma, and particularly in a plexiform neurofibroma in an NF1 patient. You're really here seeing significant atypia and significant cellularity. Uh, mitosis were present in areas, but actually in the context of this morphology, you don't need it for a diagnosis of malignancy. Really, this is a neurofibroma that is going bad. It's a plexiform neurofibroma in a patient with neurofibromatosis. Here you have an atypical mitosis almost, right? So uh, here you can see, and you can see really the demarcation. You see this is a tumor that really is changing. So this is an MPNST arising in a plexiform neurofibroma. So as I mentioned before, plexiform neurofibroma is the neurofibroma subtype that has the highest propensity for a malignant transformation, and particularly when they are large and they are present in this context of NF1. So these patients get followed uh, very closely. All right, another case, a uh, 10-year-old girl with neurofibromatosis type 1 had a plexiform neurofibroma in the base of the occipital growing for several years. And here is the imaging. And you can see here, the diagnosis of plexiform neurofibroma is a gross one. It's a low power magnification. Uh, and you can see here this appearance that uh, you have heard probably in, in the neuro, in pathology, basic pathology jargon as bag of worms. So this is a real gross diagnosis. You have, this is what a plexiform neurofibroma looks like, uh, a low magnification really. Uh, this patient actually was being followed. This was a superficial lesion and actually developed an nodule that was growing rapidly and very worrisome, therefore. And first, they did a needle biopsy. This is what I, this is what I'm showing to you here. Uh, this one was actually very interesting. Had areas that were very proliferative and spindly. So, in this context, this makes you think of MPNST as the main problem that you will be thinking about. But actually, what we saw here was a lot of heterogeneity. You have here bone formation. Okay. So these, there are some elements that are heterologous here. You even had a real giant cell reaction, a mixoid change. 
in glands, okay? You have glandular formation in this case. Well-formed glands. This patient, of course, and some of them had actually really well differentiated um, goblet cells. This patient is young, so metastatic carcinoma is not something that uh, was considered in the differential diagnosis. Some sort of a teratoma is maybe some of the germ cell tumor, something to have in mind in this case, although uh, here the history is very telling. And we have here some immunostains. SOX10 was positive in some areas, but was partially lost in the spindle cell uh, components. So again, this is something that is more commonly you will see with MPNST in high grade MPNST is loss of the mature Schwann cell markers. That is SOX10. This is S100. This is more typical what you see in MPNST. You have some which is helpful in recognizing these tumors as being Schwannian, but you have loss. This is not what you see in a Schwannoma or a neurofibroma. You have significant loss of S1, S100 in a Schwann cell neoplasm, of course. That is uh, something that is very worrisome. You don't always see it in the more lower grade MPNSTs that develop sometimes in, in neurofibromatosis type 1 patients. You may have preservation of S100, but when you have loss like this, this is something very worrisome. Of course, that's not the only problem that the patient has. The patient had these glands that, as you will suspect, were positive for. Uh, keratins, but also something that is very typical. This is chromogranin. Uh, this is actually an MPNST, with, you might assume by now, with heterologous differentiation, particularly glandular differentiation. And for whatever reason, uh, they also have a significant component of neuroendocrine cells in the glands. You saw mucin, but you also have significant chromogranin here. And INSM1. So you have this is a, another marker that we're using more often now for neuroendocrine differentiation. Has a, a nuclear pattern of staining, and you see here that these glands have a significant component of INSM1 chromogranin positive cells. So it's a curiosity in some ways, uh, but just it's something to have in mind. And another marker that we are using, this is H3K27 trimethylation, okay? And you can see here there is a significant loss in the stroma. A few of the elements still retain it, but the stroma itself is lost and this actually patient had a, a SOS12 mutation which is associated with uh, MPNST and loss of this trimethylation. So an MPNST with heterologous differentiation, glandular ulcers and was arising in a plexiform neurofibroma precursor. Okay, this is now the last case, number 12, 30 year old man developed progressive pain in the right arm. Seven years prior to had a biopsy of a mass in the brachial plexus. A follow-up imaging demonstrated regrowth of this mass in there was um, some heterogeneity now and a resection was performed. Okay, 
for whatever reason, some of the files here are not showing, but I have the slide with us. So this is the lesion. <clears throat> this is the more current biopsy, actually. And you can see very cellular tumor. Very cellular tumor. Mitotic activity. In areas you have some fascicles. So uh, with that history, of course, one the main concern is an MPNST of some kind, right? Something that, so we will try to stain it as you would any tumor that you're concerned about, a nerve sheath neoplasm. This is S100. So for sure, it's not a cellular schwannoma or anything like that. It's not a well differentiated. This loss of S100 is incompatible, really, with a benign Schwannian nerve sheath tumor in any context. Uh, so we did a few more stains, uh, SOX10, SOX10, so it was negative for an, a lot of different things. Side of keratin. There were some maybe rare cells that were positive, but for the most part negative. So uh, next step was to go back and review the first biopsy which actually looks actually almost a little lower grade almost. But more collagen. So a spindle cell neoplasm again. And actually, so they were located in the same anatomic region, and this required molecular testing for more definite diagnosis. And this is actually a synovial sarcoma. It's really the main differential diagnosis with MPNST. They look very similar. They can have a similar immunohistochemical profile. Synovial sarcoma can have some S100. MPNSTs can have some keratin, so a lot of the phenotype is there's a lot of overlapping. This one actually was confirmed uh, in by genetic means. The synovial sarcoma fusions they are not compatible with a diagnosis of MPNST. So historically, there has been these. Uh, you may see some papers out there stating that the MPNSTs with some of the fusions of synovial sarcoma, and that is not really uh, the current concept or understanding of that, you can have synovial sarcomas developing a nerve. Uh, more commonly, you have something, you can have something like this. This is uh, another case, and they can actually grow exactly like any MPNST grows a nerve, out, uh, infiltrating individual peripheral nerve fascicles. And again, the morphology is very similar in the immunophenotype. It's one of the main mimics of MPNST. Something to have in mind when you have a tumor that is um, in a nerve that may express some keratin or EMA uh, or looks a little bit uh, funny differently. So uh, this is something, another mimic to have to have in mind. Okay, so we went through the cases and now we can go through some multiple choice questions to um, cover some of the material that we just uh, reviewed. So starting with question number one, 
The most common manifestation of malignant transformation in schwannoma is A, angiosarcoma, B, epithelial MPNST, C, MPNST with glandular differentiation, D, MPNST with myogenic or hebdomyosarcomatous differentiation, what is called historically triton tumor or synovial sarcoma. I see there is little lag actually. Uh, so we are waiting just a little bit. I see it, there are lots of options for epithelioid MPNST. So that okay. is choice B. And that is correct. So you can have different forms of malignant transformation in schwannomas. Epithelial MPNST is the most common. Occasionally, you can have a more round cell component, uh, almost like a PNET or embryonal type of neoplasm, uh, and that occurs sometimes. And more rarely, you can even have an angiosarcoma. That's a recognized pattern uh, described by Fletcher and, and, and his colleagues uh, of a transformation of schwannoma. Uh, that is rare, but the most common one is MPNST, epithelial MPNST. The other are other things that you can see, malignant tumors that you can see in peripheral nerve, but not necessarily associated with a, a transformation of schwannoma at a significant rate. Question number two, which of the following immunohistochemical markers is relatively specific for MPNST? And I've listed A, EGFR, B, H3K27M mutation, H3K27 trimethylation, P16 uh, or P53. I see on um, I see answers uh, coming for C that is ACE three K twenty seven trimethylation and let me check if there is some more choices yeah I think uh, more uh, viewers are of the choice that it is uh, C ACE three K twenty seven trimethylation excellent and it's a uh, actually loss of the trimethylation the marker is that's the immunohistochemical marker but it's loss of trimethylation so that is the correct answer this is an immunohistochemical marker that has been developed in the past several years uh it is you have to make sure of course with many of these markers when you the loss is what you're looking for you have to really make sure that you have good internal controls that the non-neoplastic cells are retaining the expression to make sure that you are really interpreting loss as real and not as a technical artifact. These sometimes, we there's something else that we use in neuropathology, which is the H3K27M mutation specific antibody. This is more for gliomas that are uh, occur in the midline or diffuse midline gliomas. So those tumors have mutation, plus they're positive for that and negative. It will also have trimethylation loss by different mechanisms but sometimes these immunostains get mistaken in the in, in you know in, in practice so it's something to have in mind one is for the mutation one is for the loss of trimethylation and the trimethylation loss is what you see in mpnst you can have mpnsts that have egfr amplification uh loss of p16 and even in p53 but those markers uh, by immunohistochemistry uh are not the most robust in, in the evaluation of of mpnst so question number three, uh, long-standing neurofibroma and an NF1 patient started to grow faster recently. As I mentioned, this is something that is worrisome for malignant transformation and you have to evaluate it very carefully. h and &E of the resection demonstrates a worrisome cellular area. Which of the following mutations will be most suggestive of malignant transformation in this context? NF1, NF2, P16, third or SOS12. Uh, 
I, I see uh, answers for NF1 coming up. Let us see more. Uh, Yeah, NF1. Uh, so that's that's more people are thinking about NF1, and someone else is also thinking of DTART. So we have two different answers. Okay. So yeah, sorry, we didn't go very much over these. I kind of mentioned it in passing, but uh, actually, SOS12. So NF1 mutation, you will see it here. Really, here the key is suggestive of malignant transformation. NF1 mutations, you will see it. These patients have germline mutations, and their tumors, even the benign ones, will have a second NF1 mutation or second hit. Uh, even benign neurofibromas will have inactivation of NF1. So it is not a marker of malignant transformation in these tumors. In fact, it is expected to have NF1 mutations. The neurofibromas, NF2 is not part of those, so you will not usually see NF2 mutations in them. Um, uh, you do have P16 in the malignant. Uh, a process of these uh, is common in MPNSTs, but you can see it also in these in something that we're learning about in these atypical neurofibromas that are in the way of transforming. But really, uh, TERT is less explored, may happen, but it's not really common in, the, in these tumors. But the one that is really uh, key here is SOS12. These are part of the polycom repressive complex. So SOS12 or EED mutations, those are present in the majority of, of MPNSTs. And when you see these mutations, really they are part of this malignant transformation. They are actually part of the, of, of really, when you see them, of MPNSTs rather than uh, neoplast, uh, than uh, malignant and pre-malignant, uh, the pre-malignant or benign precursors, really. So. And these mutations lead to this loss of the trimethylation of H3K27. That's why that immunohistochemical marker is such a good surrogate for these uh, type of alterations in MPNSTs. Question number four, which of the following tumors is most specific for neurofibromatosis type 1? Diffuse neurofibroma, massive soft tissue neurofibroma, optic nerve glioma, flexible neurofibroma, and uh, oh, or plexi from Shonoma. I uh, I hear, and I can see that uh, there are some answers for plexi from neurofibroma. Let us see what else. Uh, yeah, plexi from neurofibroma is more more of our viewers are in favor of plexi from neurofibroma to be most specific for NF one. Okay, so actually, this was a very tricky question, and, uh, and we'll go over that. Why is it is it optic nerve glioma? Okay, uh, well, it's uh, so this is why uh, all these other tumors you can see them on occasion on NF1. So that's uh, and they're common in 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 this syndrome, and they are relatively uh, high occur high frequency. So uh, let's go through this so thought process. So uh, massive soft tissue nerve fibroma is the one. Uh, I, I showed an example, and actually, massive soft tissue neurofibroma only occurs in NF1. When you see a patient with this type of uh, disease, uh, neurofibroma subtype, only occurs in NF1. So, uh, never occurs outside of that. Uh, plexiform neurofibroma is almost pathognomonic, and we go when, went through it. For the most part, any if you have a patient with a large plexiform neurofibroma, that is also that's going to happen in neuro in neurofibromatosis type one. 
but it's not 100%. Uh, you can have smaller plexiform neurofibromas that occur superficially, sporadically, in a patient that has no other stigmata of NF1. So there are very few exceptions. It's important to have this in mind because you don't want to make a diagnosis of NF1 in a patient just because you still have, you have maybe even a, a real uh, plexiform neurofibroma in, in, your, in a biopsy sample. So the, uh, this is something to really have in mind that almost always, yes, plexiform neurofibromas are present in NF1, but it's not 100%. Uh, optic nerve gliomas, they are, it's a, it's a site that is favored in NF1 patients, but they can also occur sporadically, so they don't always occur. When you have bilateral optic nerve gliomas, multiple or bilateral, yes, that's almost, again, not pathognomonic for NF1, but a single optic nerve glioma can occur in uh, sporadically. Diffuse neurofibromas, you can see them in NF1, but more commonly they are sporadic. Again, these are sometimes occur cutaneously. I didn't show you an example, but uh, they, they, they cause this uh, plaque-like growth in the superficial in the skin. Uh, and plexiform neurofibromas is not part of the NF1 syndrome. Most of the plexiform neurofibromas, as I mentioned, they occur sporadically. But if they are multiple, they occur actually in NF2 or schwannomatosis, schwann, schwann, schwannoma, multiple schwannoma syndromes, not NF1. So sorry, that was a little bit tricky, but I wanted to use it as an example to highlight a little bit of how these uh, pathologies are, how specific they are for some of these syndromes that we have discussed today. And well, that's the end of it uh, for today. Hopefully you uh, enjoyed it. And uh, if you haven't been able to preview the slides, please do. These are, they're, they're good, good examples of, of the pathology that we've been discussing here today. This is the last pathcast, neuropathcast that from my end uh, for the year. Uh, we'll have one on hematolymphoid and secondary tumors of the CNS in January. And after that, we'll go more in, 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 into different topics uh, from time to time. So I've been enjoying sharing these cases that I see in my practice with you and um, and hopefully learning together about them. So uh, stay tuned for January for uh, the next and final one of this series, but it's not going to be the end of Neuropath and Neuropath in, in PathCast since uh, this, uh, I, I find this sharing this very um, educational for me as well. And of course, you can go to the to the playlist uh, that has all the neuropathology uh, ones that that way you can see really see them together if you are uh, if you have missed them uh, and you're interested in in spending more time with them and of course always feel free to reach us with questions or or suggestions for future topics. Thank you. There are a lot of questions today, Dr. Rodriguez, for you. Maybe quickly one or two I can uh, read for you. Absolutely. So there is one question, maybe which is quite practical, is that what's your experience about EMA vis a vis GLUT1 for perineural cells? That's from Anand coming from Denmark. Uh, the, uh, my experience with EMA for perineural cells? And also vis a vis GLUT1. Good. Yes. So, yes. So, for inter and we didn't go over cases of intraneural perineuriomas, which is what we tend to see more in neuropath. So, th these are markers, good markers for perineural cells. So, I use EMA and I use GLUT1. So, uh, EMA, the situation with EMA, sometimes it can be a little weaker. So, that's why another marker like GLUT1 in the perineuriomas that I have stained, they uh, almost uh, all of them also stain with uh, GLUT1. So there are good markers uh, of, of for that. The main thing, if you let's say your EMA is weak and you're not trusting it and GLUT1 is positive, I will be careful in some ways uh, and probably make sure that the cells of interest are not Schwannian. There's, there is no S100 positivity in these Schwann cells. Uh, so that will be the main caveat to make sure that it's, it's, you're not dealing with a Schwann cell tumor or Schwann cell proliferation. Uh, but if you have something there that, you know, EMA may be weak or focal and have some GLUT1 and it's negative for S100, probably you are going in the right direction of perineurioma. So, Dr. Rodriguez, actually, like perineurioma, sometimes we see also in the colonic biopsies associated with the hyperplastic polyps and all. And I think. Uh, I have also seen that the EMA hardly works, even though it morphologically looks like a perineurioma and S100 is positive, but EMA is uh, hardly positive. So is there something to do with the dilution or like, I mean, we we need to 
change a different clone for that or what is the reason you know that's right so sometimes uh, that is historically has been a problem with EMA that EMA is a you know it's a marker of meningothelial cells and perineural cells in many laboratories your positive control that you use or how you dilute it is for carcinoma or for epithelial tissues which express a lot mm -hmm. of EMA comparatively so mm -hmm. I do see occasionally uh, I have the similar problem sometimes I see meningiomas that are negative and if it's really still in their you know classic meningiomas even so you can have usually you have a little bit you know the the, the idea with EMA is that it can be very focal uh, in many of these tumors and perineuromas and meningiomas uh, what you're looking for is really linear surface staining. So even if you have a little bit in the right context, uh, you can probably make the diagnosis, you know, if everything else fits. Uh, but okay, certainly yeah. you can have some of these tumors that are negative for EMA. And that was that why that question was so appropriate, that you, have, you can have uh, other markers, GLUT1, clouding sometimes. Those are other, mm. another marker that uh, if you use it, uh, if you have it available, that can be that is positive uh, in a perineural cells. But I agree, EMA can be weak and sometimes almost absent. And you have to make sure that what type of dilution you're using in your laboratory. Right, right. And there is, thank you so much. There's another question like uh, regarding immunomarkers. So Anand wants to also know that uh, if you want to share the clone for HGK27. Uh, yes, uh, I can do that. Uh, let me see. What is the best way to do it through? Um, yeah, maybe uh, um, in, in Facebook or Facebook or you can. Uh, yeah, I think that should be the best way. I think if he has any other idea or if he can share the email, we can do that, too. That's later. right. That's right. So I'll, I'll put a place in, in Facebook since, you know, since they may be of interest. And yeah. if they can send me an email, direct email as well and, uh, or, or to you and, and we can share. Happy to share that. Like yeah yeah okay and one last question from minesh so who wants to know to what is how to diagnose a n u b p in the context of nerve sheet tumor oh yes that's a uh and i think a n u b p so you're talking about this uh, atypical neurofibromatous tumor of in, uh, undetermined biologic potential correct i think that's what we're referring to and uh is that I think that I assume that that's the question. So, um, so yes, that's a evolving concept. Uh, the idea there is that we used to have, this is important, it's a situation, the concept of a typical neurofibroma or a neurofibroma that is worrisome is really applied to neurofibromas, usually large neurofibromas, plexiforms that are developed in the context of NF1. So those are the ones that get followed. They may have an abnormal imaging or some sort of clinical alteration that, or a manifestation that is worrisome for malignant transformation and they get a resection or biopsy and then you have this uh, lesion and where do you pull a trigger for MPNST or where, which ones are the ones that you feel that are really pre-malignant. And these, what happened with atypical neurofibroma is that it's a, it's a term that has been a little used in many different ways. In pathology, we have used it as not something that is really necessarily that worrisome for malignancy, but something that may have degenerative atypia or, or some other alteration. While in the clinical jargon, it has become, it's almost something that is really worrisome for something that is either MPNST almost or in the way through it. So that's why this concept of a typical neurofibromatous uh, uh, tumor had uh, had come. So you, those are the tumors that really have a, a couple of features that are worrisome, but not you're not at MPNST yet. So you can have increased proliferation, some atypia, but not really at the point of calling them MPNST. And, and really it's a term that almost has substituted uh, histologically uh, uh, the concept of atypical neurofibroma. That's it, I think, uh, Dr. Rodriguez. And thanks so much, everyone, for joining in. And in fact, today we had so many viewers from across the world. For the first time, I at least saw that someone from Mauritius joined. So Poonam was from Mauritius. There was Johanna from South Sudan. I haven't seen before Walid from Tunisia and a lot of uh, viewers from across the world. Thanks so much for um, joining us across so many different timelines. We appreciate your encouragement and always feel free to follow our Facebook page and subscribe to the YouTube channel and also subscribe to our newsletter. And as Dr. Rodriguez said that he would be back in January for the next lecture in the series and he would continue later as well. So 
we definitely probably coming up with another lecture with not neuropath of course in december so we will stay we will keep you posted so thank you again thanks everybody thank you dr rodriguez thank you my pleasure and it was great uh, being with all of you